Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, all in here. And uh, Dr. Kamran Ahmed is joining us from uh, uh, London, UK, uh, for this webinar. I hope everybody is he hearing me, right? Yes, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. It's a pleasure to have you with us, uh, Cameron, and thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us in this webinar. I hope everybody will uh, benefit from this, and it's good to see you after uh, a good while, uh, my friend. Yeah, I yeah. hope Ramadan is easy, and I hope uh, COVID is uh, easing down uh, there in London. Yes, thank you very much. It's settling down, but still, I mean, lockdown hasn't gone away quick, fully. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. there's still been a struggle, but I'm sure it'll take time. We're in a complete lockdown here in Kuwait as well for uh, for another two weeks probably or maybe less. Well, hopefully everything will will settle down in a, in a near future, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Al-Kendri, uh, our uh, uh, big brother and uh, senior consultant uh, from Kuwait, uh, he joined us. Uh, he's going to be the moderator of this session. Uh, uh, I will, uh, I think... Dr. al Kendri, uh, I'm not sure if uh, your microphone is on. I will try to. Unmute, yeah. Ah, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. 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 Okay. Dr. Kamran, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you. How are you? Nice to meet you. And, uh, and you likewise, thank you. Well, welcome uh, with us in this meeting. What is the time now at UK? It's uh, seven o'clock. Oh, okay. So it's not too far from us. Uh. No, it's not. Okay. okay. What time is the iftar, uh, Dr. It's Kamran? It's quarter to nine. It's still nearly two hours to go. <laughs> okay. So hopefully uh, we'll be finished before that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we would love to invite you for Raftar in Kuwait at uh, maybe in the future uh, year, inshallah, <laughs> without <laughs> Corona at that time. Yeah, okay. that's a problem. So, yeah, yeah. Dr. al Kendri is our moderator. I think uh, you should uh, guide us from now on. Um, the schedule yeah, is uh, Dr. Kamran will start. Uh, okay. I'm not sure if you want to start now or you want to wait uh, a couple uh, let's minutes wait. more. It's up to yeah, you. Is Dr. Ahmed Al-Nizi around? Dr. Ahmed, I don't see him on the participants, but uh, I'm sure he's going to join us now. I will contact him by phone as well to make sure he's in. Um, uh, so the schedule, Dr. Kamran, then uh, myself, then Dr. al -Nizi. Our talks will be like uh, 15 to 20 minutes. And then okay. I believe you have uh, some cases to share, Dr. al Kendri as well. Yes. And the discussion is upon your uh, judgment to whatever you want to... However, you are, you want to run this uh, sure. webinar, it's uh, your call. Sure, Thank you sure, very much absolutely. for everyone who's uh, joining us. Well, what about the rest of the people? Can we see them there? or? Um, so you can, in your browser, you can press on uh, one of the... the uh, no, there is like in the top right corner, there's, mm. um, there's a square and there's like uh, little squares beside each other. If you press yeah, the yeah. little squares, you can see everyone I see. or most of the people. Um, so for the participants, if they want to uh, share with us their video, uh, their picture, uh, they're more than uh, welcome. Uh, unfortunately, because of security reasons and because we, want, we don't want any uh, misuse of this, uh, we will have to stop uh, the chatting and we'll stop the, uh, uh, the audio as well for everyone. Uh, whoever has a question, Please forward this to Dr. Ahmed Al Kendri and uh, our moderator, and he will uh, arrange the questions accordingly. So, how many people we have now, like joining us? Can you tell? Uh, uh, to so we have so far thirty-three people joining us. Thirty-three people. I think yeah, let's let's start, uh, and inshallah, Dr. Ahmed Al Kendri will join us. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Alhamdulillah. I'd like to thank. Uh, uh, the uh, Kuwait Urological Association for giving us this opportunity to meet and share an uh, important topic uh, with all of you as colleagues and uh, special thanks to my colleague Dr. Hussain al nizi for his excellent effort to put this webinar and also we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mustafa al-Mahmid for arranging all these things and also all the participants 
Uh, my name is uh, Ahmed al Kandiri. I'm a urologist and associate professor at Kuwait University. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to have with us a, a distinguished urologist uh, from UK. We have Dr. Kamran Ahmed. He's an associate professor of urology at King's College London, and he's a consultant urologist of King's College Hospital London. Uh, Mr. Amran, uh, Kamran will talk to us about the medical management of BPA. So our topic tonight is about uh, uh, updates in the management of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Uh, Dr. Kamran, uh, you, the, uh, the talk is yours, so please, uh, Thank you, you can start. Thank you. I will put it in this full screen and uh, let me share the screens with me. Uh, can everybody see my screen? No, we cannot see. How, how do we do that? Uh, let's make the screen to be seen by the... So, Dr. Kamran, you go to uh, share screen and then uh, you press, it will show you different screens that you opened. You choose the PowerPoint and then you uh, press share. And at that time, we will see your, your screen at that time. Okay. And then it's coming up. Can you see it now? No, unfortunately not yet. Okay, I'll just, um, probably we'll have to change the settings. I mean, that's why it's coming up, but hopefully it'll come up. Did you find the share screen option? Yeah, just, I found it. It's just uh, uh, trying to uh, go through this firewall and security. <laughs> okay. um, it, hopefully, it should be okay now. So. There's a there's a firewall coming up, so that's that's the main issue. So uh, take just, your time. Uh, can you see it now or it's still not there? Still not there, unfortunately. Okay, I'll try again. Uh, so, it should be a two step thing. Uh, probably you get a firewall or. I'm yeah, not... that's why it's, um, I mean, I'm not sure about what's, what exactly is happening. It's uh, blocking everything, actually. It's just the laptop probably causing the problem. So how is the situation while you're searching uh, in UK? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, <laughs> things are getting back to normal gradually. Just a um, uh, few of the, um, I mean, uh, uh, professions, they are allowed to get back. Otherwise, the, 
uh, things are still going on. I mean, some kind of uh, blockade is still there. So still no, no elective cases, only emergency cases? No, just, just the emergency, nothing elective so far, apart from some cancer work. So I'm struggling here, I must say that. It's just um, not sure if I can uh, use something else to do that. It's just not working with my screen. You, you, yeah. you can just speak while you're talking. I mean, it's all uh, internet based. Listening to you is, is helpful. If it works, then fine. And maybe uh, uh, saying if I forward you the link of my slides, then uh, would you be able to run it and I can speak? Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, do you want me to start first and then you, you yeah, follow I think, on? I think that would be better. I can try in the meantime then, yeah. What do you think, Dr. Kendry? Is okay, that's fine. I mean, so uh, we apologize for this technical issue. We will start with uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Hussein Arnizi. He's a consultant urologist, head of urology uh, unit in Adan Hospital. He's uh, an neurologist and robotic surgeon in Sabah Al Ahmed and also in Adan Hospital. Dr. Hussain will give us the talk about TURP. Is it still the gold standard, Dr. Hussain? Yeah. Um, and she'll just show us how it works because I will, I hope it will work with me. So should be, it should be a two step thing. Uh, um, do you see my screen? Mm, yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Who's this? Ahmed Lanizi. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. We can hear you. So okay. I will start my presentation, if you allow me, Dr. Kendri. Yes, yes, you can start. Dr. Hussain and will start because of the technical issue. We'll have Dr. Hussain start. Okay, until Dr. Kamran will uh, fix this issue, I will go ahead. So good, good evening, everyone. I will talk about a somewhat a controversial uh, subject, uh, the TRB. I know Dr. Ahmed Kendri, our moderator, is uh, a Holub uh, fan and uh, he might uh, argue with me a little bit about this but uh, <laughs> I, I think still TRP is, is, is a gold standard so mm -hmm. if we look at the uh, definition by the uh, by language uh, what, what is the gold standard defined as it's any standardized procedure uh, that uh, or intervention that of a known validity and reliability and which is generally taken to be the best available against which all other tests and new tests and protocols are compared. Um, so if we go back to, uh, if we go back, uh, go back to history and we see how TRB came up all the way to become the gold standard, um, this will take us to the early uh, 19th century when uh, uh, Sir James Guthrie, a British military surgeon, um, uh, came up with the idea of incising the bladder neck and small uh, prostates instead of doing perineal uh, uh, prostatectomies uh, by using uh, uh, blindly passed uh, metal sound with a, with a concealed knife. And that was in 1834. However, he did not do much, uh, many cases at that time. Um, Siviali and Mercier took this uh, notion further and Mercier claimed to have done 300 su successful procedures using the concealed knife uh, uh, procedure. Uh, this was taken further and instruments improved with time. So in 1887, uh, uh, Boutini came up with uh, his instrument to heat the prostate. So actually to burn a channel through the through a small prostate. And he claimed to have done 57 cases with two deaths and 12 failures. So that was not very successful procedure. I hope everyone can hear me very well. Yes, very well. Okay. Um, until the early uh, 20th century when Young came up with his uh, uh, punch prostatectomy pro uh, procedure or instrument. And this was actually the... Uh, first notion of the modern uh, TRP procedure where, where you actually cutting and taking out part of the prostate uh, by uh, endoscopic procedure. However, this was a blind bunch and uh, uh, then uh, Fer uh, Fenwick came up with the idea of uh, using a loop current to actually loop cut the prostate, but this was not successful because of the uh, electrophysiology uh, problems. 
and Maximilian uh, in 1926 uh, was very successful in using a new radio frequency uh, dithermy machine to actually cut or loop cut the, the prostate uh, using uh, that uh, procedure uh, invented by Wobbler or the uh, dithermy machine invented by Wobbler. Uh, in 1930, uh, McCarthy came up with his uh, uh, telescope, uh, the new telescope, and in combination with the Stern method of loop cutting the prostate, this actually uh, uh, came up with what is uh, considered the primary prototype of modern uh, resectoscopes. So improvement in instruments and technique continued until the 1974 when Iglesias came up with his uh, continuous flow uh, resectoscope, which, uh, uh, which gave the surgeons the ability of continuously cutting the prostate without losing vision and without the need of uh, a frequent emptying of the prostate. What else? In the uh, 1980s and the early 1990s, uh, people were uh, more trained uh, of doing uh, TRPs and they were uh, able to take uh, larger prostates uh, by uh, doing conventional TRP. So I think that's, that's the period when uh, uh, TRP was uh, uh, announced as the uh, gold standard. And this was um, very well uh, supported by the uh, landmark study done by uh, Mibos et al, which was a multi-center study that included nearly 4,000 patients. Uh, that was published in 1989 in the Journal of Virology, and they showed clearly that uh, the mortality of uh, TRP was low at 0.2 percent, and, and the morbidity was uh, uh, actually uh, low as well. So, uh, the number of, of TRPs for treating PBH uh, increased steeply after that until the uh, late 1990s, uh, when uh, there was very uh, well improved uh, uh, medications specific for uh, TRP or for sorry PBH management were invented and this medical therapy actually impacted the number of TRPs and the indications of doing TRP. So now people are shifting from doing TRP to everyone instead they're doing TRP for patients who are failing medical therapy. So if we look now, what is the situation after this all? Uh, and we, if we look at the trends of PBH management uh, uh, in, in the world, we take some studies from the states. And if we look at this study, which was published in the Journal of Endurology in 2015, that looked at the trends of utilization of laser prostatectomy and ambulatory surgical uh, procedures uh, for treatment of PBH from the year 2000 until 2011. They use the New York statewide uh, planning and research system. And we can find from the graph that uh, TRB was still in 2011, the most commonly uh, uh, performed procedure for treatment of VBH. If we look at the study um, uh, closely, we find that uh, there was a problem that Medicaid patients were less likely to get laser treatment than private insurance patients which means there was a bias in offering uh, treatment options. Uh, also, we find that, uh, or the authors concluded that TRB and lasers had similar complication rate, except for erectile disorders, which is a known inherent problem with uh, monopolar TRP due to using uh, uh, glycine instead of cyanide. Another study that looked at the trends uh, from 2011 until 2015, and this study was recently published in the Journal of Endurology. Uh, it looked at the patients from uh, the American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, and we can find that still in 2015, nearly 60% of patients were offered TRP or conventional TRP uh, to treat their PBH. So TRB until 2015 was the most commonly done procedure in the States. Um, so uh, what is the situation in Canada? I think it's the same uh, because if we look at this survey, which included uh, 12 training centers and uh, 89 residents responded to the survey, uh, we find that in regards to the centers, 100% of the centers had sets and instruments available for monopolar TRP. However, for the other procedures, we find that not even half of the centers 
uh, had any of the other instruments for bipolar therapy, green laser therapy, or for HALIB or other, uh, uh, other procedures. What about the exposures by resident? We can see clearly from this graph that most of the residents actually were very well exposed to doing monopolar uh, TRP by assisting, performing, or seeing. However, for the other procedures, the situation was very different and it wasn't promising. Although we know that one of the pioneers of doing uh, HOLIPS in that situation and who started uh, HOLIPS and uh, actually modified the techniques of HOLIPS was uh, Dr. Mustafa Al Hilali from Montreal in Canada, uh, but that did not affect the uh, situation in, in Canada. So what about in Kuwait? I think we have, I'm not sure about the number, but we have nearly 100 qualified urologists in Kuwait. How many are doing routine TRPs? I'm not sure. I know Dr. Kendri is doing uh, routine TRPs, but I'm not sure about anyone who's doing routinely TRP. I know that some other doctors are uh, planning or uh, are actually training on doing HOLIBS. And um, the, um, this is a trend now, uh, as we notice in social media and uh, by talking to our friends, that many people are actually uh, trying to move to doing HOLIBS, but still TRV is the mostly uh, commonly uh, done uh, procedure. What about outcome comparison of PBH surgical intervention? If we look at this meta-analysis uh, or uh, uh, very famous uh, meta-analysis that was published in 2010 in European uh, Urology uh, that included 27 studies from 1997 until 2009 and uh, there was uh, 23 uh, randomized control trial in, those, uh, in that meta-analysis uh, to assess the functional outcomes of cone BBH treatment uh, and uh, comparing them to TRP. We can see here from this uh, diagram that the most uh, wide or most commonly done uh, procedure was actually monopolar TRP, and the second most commonly uh, done uh, procedure was bipolar TRP. So uh, we can see the vast difference between the uh, TRP and the other procedure. And if we look at the functional outcomes, we find that an IPSS score, quality of life, uh, Humax and PVR, they were all comparable between all the procedures, between lasers and between conventional TRP. Uh, some of them were actually in favor of TRP more than other uh, uh, procedures or lasers. Uh, if we look at those uh, uh, tables, uh, I, I'm not asking you to read all of this, uh, but this will show us the uh, uh, perioperative complications, uh, late complications as well. And uh, when we look at those, believe me, there, is, there were comparable safety profiles to all the procedures. Maybe there was a trend toward uh, lower uh, overall complication rate using bipolar TRP, but the um, uh, authors concluded that this meta-analysis demonstrate statistically comparable efficacy uh, and morbidity for the missed procedure versus temporary TRP. So there was no difference. Um, another recent uh, meta-analysis and the systematic, uh, systematic review that was recently published uh, in World Journal of, of Urology, uh, which looked at uh, or compared between lasers and bipolar technology uh, by Go et al. Uh, this included uh, uh, 27 patients and this was uh, included uh, studies up to uh, the year 2018. And the authors concluded that early efficacy and safety profiles were comparable between lasers and bipolar technology. However, lasers were superior in terms of smaller uh, hemoglobin reduction, but this did not translate into a better transfusion rate. Uh, lasers were actually better in shorter catheterization time and shorter hospital stay. But when we look at the studies or the meta-analysis, the difference was only a few hours. So what I think uh, uh, is, is better uh, to serve patients. Uh, we, we should actually uh, improve our uh, TRP outcomes. How, uh, how we can do that? Probably by using uh, bipolar technology instead of the monopolar technology, because we know that it, uh, it is the same technique we, uh, with the same efficiency and outcomes. Uh, however, uh, there is a, a proved uh, reduced uh, morbidity by using the uh, bipolar technology uh, because uh, we are not using glycine, so there is no TR syndrome at all. Um, there is a improved uh, uh, 
uh, less blood transfusion, less uh, clot retention, and less urethral structure uh, in uh, the cases of uh, 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 bipolar uh, when compared with monopolar TRP. Uh, another technique to improve uh, TRP outcomes, I know that uh, now in the era of uh, new technologies for BBH treatment, everybody is talking about the retrograde, uh, retrograde ejaculation. Uh, so how can we uh, serve our patients better with TRP? Probably by doing ejaculation preserving techniques. This has been published uh, since 2014 by Lucy et al in the Journal of uh, Andurology, and, they, and uh, there's a more recent study by Gyal et al. Uh, they proved that this technique might actually be successful in nearly 90% of integrated uh, uh, of patients uh, accomplishing integrated ejaculation. Um, also in those procedures, they proved that uh, uh, by preserving integrated ejaculation, they actually uh, improved voiding parameters significantly. Um, finally, when we look at uh, new technologies, I know Dr. Ahmed al anizi will talk about new technologies, and they do have a role in uh, PBH treatment. However, uh, all recent studies, when we look at them, they actually compare their uh, new technologies to TRP, which is the gold standard. And this is our argument today, that TRP is still the gold, uh, the gold standard. So all new studies are actually comparing new technologies to the gold standard, which is TRP. Guidelines, the European guidelines still state that transurethral section of the prostate is the current standard surgical procedure for men with prostate sizes of 30 to 80 ml, and but there are some moderate to severe lots secondary to PBO. What about the American uh, guidelines? They clearly state that TRP remains historical standard by which all other subsequent surgical approaches and treatments for PBH are compared and serve and serves as the reference group for the other techniques in this guideline. Uh, so still according to both the European and the American guidelines, TRB is still the uh, gold standard. So if we go back to our slide from the start and about uh, uh, language, uh, uh, TRB does fulfill the criteria to be the gold standard for uh, uh, PBH management as uh, TRB is a standardized procedure with known validity and reproducibility and reliable outcomes and uh, uh, still TRB uh, is compared to all new technologies uh, when we want to uh, prove that uh, new technologies are actually working. I think I will conclude in this, uh, 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 in this page. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hussain and Nizi, for this uh, very thorough and uh, concise uh, uh, summary of history and uh, recent uh, recommendations for TRP. I just want to ask a question. Since sure. we are in Kuwait and you know we have residents, uh, how easy it's to train residents to do TRP in your hospital or? or because you know the number of cases are not as we expect to train. So, so just if you want to train them on TRP, what's your advice to help them go through this? So, um, as you said, the the problem is the number of TRPs performed nowadays because of the um, effective medical treatment. Uh, this actually has delayed uh, the, the uh, management, uh, the surgical management of PVH patients. So now we are seeing uh, more of uh, older patients requiring. TRPs instead of having their TRPs in the 70s, they are requiring their, their TRPs in the 80s and 90s even. So that will affect uh, uh, to some extent the uh, perioperative mor morbidity to the patient. Uh, so uh, the number and the quality of patients might have an effect on, uh, on training, but uh, however, I think uh, if you start training uh, the residents from um, R3 or R4 and they're uh, like early uh, senior uh, re resident uh, years, um, they will actually be able to uh, do TRPs. And you have to have a system in, in training them. So actually if you uh, start by those years, by uh, giving them few cuts and by showing them how to go uh, systematically and, and doing TRPs, I think by the end of uh, uh, R5, they will uh, uh, be uh, very, very well trained and doing their TRPs. I think that's, that's the way. 
um, being involved in every TRP uh, patient, uh, every TRP procedure is also a goal because as we said, uh, the number of patients is not that huge uh, these days and that's something that we cannot do anything about. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hussain. Thank is you. Dr. Kamran ready or should we yes, go to the I, 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 is have, it well? I have changed the laptop to Windows and is let's it? see whether if this works. Is it working now? Uh, yeah, I've changed my laptop now, so let's, let's see uh, if it works. So let's let's just, uh, uh, we'd like to... Okay, so, so now it's our pleasure to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Kamran Ahmed. He's a consultant urologist from King's College Hospital in London. Uh, he will talk about the medical management of BPH. Dr. Kamran, uh, you can start, please. Okay, can, can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can. Okay, so it means Windows is more reliable than the Mac. <laughs> mm. Yeah, always stick with Windows. Okay, thank you very much for asking me to give this talk. It's um, basically all about uh, medical management and prior to medical management I thought uh, I would include some basics of uh, prostate enlargement its investigations some natural history and what the is like. so um, I haven't got any conflict of interest so uh, for starting with the uh, basics of prostate like zonal anatomy what part of the prostate is involved I've got a few definitions to share as well and then um, I'll go through the general medical treatment so this is the uh, uh, prostate, different zones are there. We are all familiar uh, about these zones. It's just reiterating that uh, this is the transitional zone that basically when it gets enlarged, it causes the symptoms. It enlarges with age. And then as you can see around the urethra encompasses it when it gets bigger, not only gets bigger towards outside, but also towards the inside. As we get all the symptoms. Certain, certain definitions I would say we all familiar with the uh, term lower urinary tract symptoms. It's a non-specific term for symptoms, uh, which is attributed to a number of causes related to storage and voiding. BPE is a clinical finding, which is um, uh, basically, we can say, histological enlargement or we do hyperplasia of prostate tissue and then bladder outflow I cannot see the screen. Can you see the screen now? Actually, it's a frozen to the first slide, so if, I'm not sure why it's not advancing. No. Uh, can you see now? I, I still not see it. Can you it's guys still see the, it? Same, the same page? Yes. It's the same page coming up. Okay. No, well, actually, it's on the side. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now it's yes, yes. Yeah. You now can see now. Oh, yes. Now it's moving. Yes. It's okay now. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is what, uh, can you see the slides with a few definitions now? Um, yes, but... Yes, yes. So okay. when you see the slides... If you put it on the... Uh, <coughs> on the show mode. So I think you're still having the slides on the, on the side. So... Oh, so show mode is not coming up. Okay. That... Okay. Is, okay. It's okay, uh, as long as you can proceed, it's okay. Shall I go to Turkey? Yeah, sure, okay. sure. If it's not coming up, so continue. I'll we, go we to here, then. that's not a problem. So, uh, so that's, um, uh, this is what I was uh, mentioning about LUTs, BPE, and bladder outflow obstruction. Then, um, uh, as you can see, LUTs can, uh, can be because of any of these reasons. I've taken this figure from uh, EAU uh, guidelines book. So what we are talking about here is the uh, benign prosthetic um, uh, obstruction related to BPE. And then uh, clinical BPE is uh, BPH is describes the histological basis of uh, uh, benign prostatic enlargement and that results in bladder outflow obstruction and it gives rise to low urinary tract symptoms. That's we all familiar about. I just thought this reiterate all these. As, uh, it's a consensus statement uh, that was described in um, uh, late 90s. Uh, as you can see here, um, when uh, Enlargement of prostate takes place, low urinary tract symptoms, they occur, bladder outflow obstruction. So for medical treatment, this yellow part that you can see amongst these three circles is the basic thing that actually uh, 
uh, requires some kind of um, treatment, medical or surgical treatment. So we're targeting this group, which has got bothersome low urinary tract symptoms. The other group that lie within these circles outside, they can mostly be managed with wait and see or conservative, conservative measurement options. Different risk factors are there with age, the risk increases and the androgens and I mean, whenever they increase in amount, the risk is there. It results in growth of the prostate. Certain systemic conditions like obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia can increase the risk of uh, uh, low genetic tract symptoms because they cause systemic effects. They alter the metabolism. So that's why sometimes the prostate gets bigger earlier or the associated features type. Symptoms of BPH could be uh, voiding related or storage related. Voiding is when uh, it's an active process and uh, most of it is in the storage phase. So whenever these symptoms are related to the voiding, it can result in hesitancy, takes time to start urination, intermittent weakening in streams, and that's what people complain of. But people, when they come in, they come in with the associated symptoms because the obstruction occurs over the passage of time and that results in storage symptoms as well. So it's a combination of the system and careful history would just like tell us how to differentiate between these two. This is a very important slide. I, mean, I would say that um, uh, we can use the, uh, uh, the slide to explain it to the patients about the uh, prevalence. So prevalence is the uh, presence of a disease at any point of time in a, in a population. And that is, um, as you can see, below 30, the risk is actually prevalence of 0%. 40 to 49, 14% of, of people um, uh, can have um, BPH-related symptoms. And above 70, uh, above 79, up to 40%. So overall, group, overall uh, prevalence is 25% and above 40, up to 70 or 80 years of age. Sorry, is my phone's ringing. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. And then, uh, then coming to the natural history of um, uh, the prostate, um, there, are, there are a few landmark studies which has been described in the literature, and most of the studies have actually been initiated and completed in within 1990s, but some of them have extended up to early 2004 or five, and this is the result we are all relying on. That's how we describe uh, the natural history of BPH. The main studies were Onset County study, a Canadian study, and then MTOP study. The Onset County study is a longitudinal study uh, that was uh, done in 1990, and the follow-up was uh, for about for 12 years and included more than 2,000 patients with age. Yes, and um, progression of BPH within this study based on the data was defined by duration of IPSS or ADSA, by deterioration of quality of life, maximum urine flow, prostate volume, and acute urine retention. So there are certain numbers here, as you can see, volume 30 to 40 ml suggests progression. PSA increase is above 1.4 or 1.6, again suggests progression. And IPSS score, any increase in IPSS score yeah, above 0 0.18 points per year is again uh, a sign of a progression. And so is the QMAX increase 2.1% per year. That means 0 0.2 ml um, uh, per year. And the prostate growth, if it's 2% uh, per year, that is again a progression and probability of acute urinary retention. If someone's in 50s with these symptoms and all enlargement symptoms, it's one in 100. If someone's above 70, is one in 10 and above 80 is one in three. So that kind of significant, all these numbers have. So that's crucial that when we are managing these patients, either expectantly or through medical management options, we need to know all these numbers. Then again, a relative risk of uh, acute urinary retention, the way how it increases, I mean, is um, if uh, IPSS is more, or, uh, more than seven or less than seven, three times difference, then trust volume mostly we evaluate the volume of the prostate, other options, MRI, and the QMAX, PVR, and PSA. You can see the range is between three to four percent. It means by changing certain numbers up there. 
Coming to the assessment, I'll just uh, put this um, uh, details over here from the EAU guidelines. I don't have to go into the details, but it's important that whenever we're assessing a patient, complete history regarding the voiding and the storage symptoms should be taken. I'm not putting in, in, in this into the slide mode because it comes up with the, it, it, you won't be able to see, that's why uh, just going through uh, one by one. So then uh, IPSS scoring sheet is really important. Prior to a patient coming to the clinic, the patient should have an IPSS scoring sheet. An IPSS scoring sheet has been translated across different languages and validated. And the flow rate evaluation, some clinics send, that, send it to them prior to this clinic, or sometimes they take it home with us and do it for three days. That is the frequency volume charts. And then evaluation of um, uh, prostate size through so, uh, a digital rectal examination. And urine tip is important to make sure there's no infection or uh, immature, microscopic hematuria. PSA, I mean, PSA is, is an area that people tread very carefully um, uh, evaluating the PSA and uh, it's um, well documented. It should be an informed decision and should be done after counseling. But as you can see, when I, the reason why I showed you these progression studies in the pre previous few slides regarding the natural history because PSA is an important in order to evaluate the progression. So these patients, in my opinion, should have PSA, but with the counseling. And then renal functions, which include creatinine and EGFR to make sure that renal tract's okay. And if there is any kind of abnormality within that, then proceed to an ultrasound scan of the kidney and the bladder to make sure that's all okay and there's no blockage because of the prostate. And the urophlometry is mandatory for these patients. They should have it because that not only gives us uh, the voided volume estimation, it gives us a Qmax and gives us a residual volume. And then uh, cystoscopy only indicated if uh, someone's coming in with hematuria, persistent microscopic hematuria, or if there is a previous history of uh, prostate um, uh, treatment, endoscopic treatment to rule out any kind of stricture. So when we do IPSS, I'm sure everyone uses that. And then a few facts about uh, urine flow rate. Urine flow rate is affected significantly by age. This is what I put in up here. In males, if less than 40 is 21 ml per second, 40 to 60 is should be more than 18 ml per second. Above 60, more than 13 ml per second is accepted. And within females, I mean, just in female group, I mean, as you can see, 25 and 18 is a cutoff. So age and sex, they are just obviously significant determining factors. Voided volumes, I mean, uh, for the flow rate evaluation, it should be more than 150 ml in order to have a reliable test. If it's not more than 50 ml, we just have to repeat it again. And then um, it, it actually determines bladder outflow obstruction and overactivity by just looking at the graph pattern. And with regards to the obstruction, 99% of probability obstruction is there if the Qmax is less than 10 ml per second. So this is, you can see how important this test is. And then 60% probability if it's between 10 and 15 and 30% if it's more than 15 ml per second. But I mean, these days, if we repeat these uh, flow rate evaluation twice, and this figure even comes down to 10 to 15 even, but this is based on the old study. So that's why I mean, we just have to quote this. Then coming to the pressure flow study, I won't take too much time here. This like, basically, this is the only study, the urodynamics is the only study that can actually differentiate between the obstruction and the use of activity. And uh, the indications are quite a few with, the, with regards to this. The voided volume is less than 150 ml. Uh, Dr. Kamran, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, if we can go a little bit faster, so. Yeah, yeah, coming through. So that's um, 150 ml for um, uh, voided volume. And then uh, if there are certain indications, I won't go through just to save the time here. Then coming to the management, uh, actual thing that we we're going to discuss is um, that includes watchful waiting and uh, pharmacotherapy. So uh, watchful waiting is uh, for someone who have got uh, mild or non-bothersome low urine tract symptoms, and that's all based on IPSS score. So uh, first line treatment for these patients is lifestyle modification. Fluid restriction, I typically say to my patients, to avoid taking fluid at least three half hours prior to going to the bed, and then irritating fluids that irritate the bladder, like alcohol or caffeine should be avoided. Drugs should be monitored. I mean, you can ask the lifestyle change, like ask the patients to take the diet in the morning and they all can be changed. 
and then constipation and elderly important factor to manage bladder training and retraining time voided double voiding all these things do matter and then the pelvic floor exercises and before starting the medical therapy i would say uh, phytotherapy uh, is an alternative treatment that may possibly work because of anti-inflammatory effects by and then interference with the growth factors. So that's how it works. The soft palmetto has got, I mean, is the, one of the extract that's mostly studies, but most recent Cochrane review that was done in 2012, which included 32 trials, it actually did not show any improvement in urinary fluid measurement of prostate size with this. However, the study done in 2004 by Boyle, that actually showed improvement in the peak flow. There's, there's a variable evidence, but we're mostly relying on the Cochrane review. So this is um, mostly for those patients who don't want to go for the medical treatment in order to side, avoid the side effect. So this can be considered for this group of patients. Coming to the medical therapy, I would only talk about four main groups. Blockers, 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, 5 and 5 n some combination therapy. So I would go through these bit by bit and then I will also explain the evidence behind it. So alpha blockers which uh, relax the smooth muscles around the prostate area around the bladder neck and they are long-term effective treatment. So alpha blockers, uroselective alpha blockers are actually available now which target 1A uh, receptors that include tamsulosin and and there are also non-selective alpha blockers that um, result in overall alpha blockade like doxycycline and teresocin. And they improve IPSS actually rapidly. Within a few days, patients will tell you that there's a difference or no difference. The adverse events of these two groups, that is 1A and 1-alpha uh, blockade, dif differs because teresocin and doxycycline can have, because of the effect and duration because it causes most dizziness and fatigue and asthenia. So tamsulosin doesn't cause these symptoms but it results in ejaculatory dis uh, disturbances in about 10 to 20 percent of patients. But these two points are important to remember that none of the alpha blockers they change the prostate volume or PSA and none of the alpha blockers change the natural history or progression of the prostate diseases. So that things are important there there for long term to improve the symptoms. So just I'll just put this uh, slide here to show different receptors. I can see prostatic alpha one A receptors, in blue color, are there around the prostate and the bladder neck. That's why where the tamsulosin has got the effect. Where the red ones appear around here, that's where a whole of the alpha blockade takes place. So that's why when the whole of the alpha blockade takes place, you will get more side effects. So that's why we should keep this in mind. When treating these patients. This graph shows that when uh, uh, alfusocin or tamsulosin started in patients with IPSS around this range 9 to 11, it drops immediately. Tamsulosin effects rapidly than the alfusocin in the beginning, but the long term, after 12 weeks, the effect or improvement in the symptoms is mostly the same. So the side effects mainly that we talk about to the patients, specifically the tamsulosin and the vent receptor, laser congestion, drop in the blood pressure that's orthostatic, some degree of dizziness or tiredness when they started. So that's when you ask them to take it in the evening mostly. And then ejaculatory problems and retrograde ejaculation has been reported with these drugs as well. And then um, next one is uh, intraoperative floppy virus syndrome, which is not very common, but it can occur with tamsulosin. And people so the careful history is important, especially people with uh, complicated cataract surgery. This one should be. Uh, I think this one should be, um, uh, should be careful and given to the so Then coming to 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, so that uh, uh, they actually reduce the dihydrotestosterone that, that reduces the growth of the prostate. And then coming to 5-alpha reductase inhibitors details, so they overall shrink the prostate size and they limit the clinical progression of the prostate. So that's why, I mean, you can see the natural history of the prostate is changed over here. And then minimal effect for these medications up to three to six months as compared to the tamsulosin effect. You can see alpha-reductase inhibitors can take up to three months to show some effect in, in improvement in the symptoms. So they don't act that rapidly. Alpha-reductase, um, as you can see, limit the progression, improve the flow rate and uh, IPSS. And then they're more noticeable in patients with a larger prostate 
of 30 or 40 grams of the body will be positive that is smaller, they're not going to affect that um, uh, effectively if, uh, in these kind of patients. And then two different types of finest, uh, alpha directase inhibitors we commonly use, dutasteride, finasteride, and there's not much difference between these two um, uh, medications. Here. Then coming to the evidence, so uh, PROSCA long term uh, efficacy and safety study, uh, the one that has, uh, has been well quoted, and it's a large, one of the largest studies with more than 3,000 patients over four years. And uh, this study uses 5 milligrams of an asteroid with placebo. So the outcome of this study was that it actually reduced the relative risk up to 55% in PPH surgery and 57% of development of acute urinary tax reduction in these patients. And you can see clearly in this graph over here, and this is an advantage of, um, as you can see, the finasteride overall changing the natural history of the condition. That's another evidence that's the uh, PROAS study that again, more than 3,000 mm -hmm. finasteride over two years. And similar kind of results, 40% relative risk um, uh, reduction in the PPH surgery and 55% in development of acute urinary retention in this study. So these two uh, are important pieces of evidence to show that um, uh, finasteride or um, uh, detasteride, they uh, reduce the risk of BPH surgery and reduce the risk of AUR. And then there's another study with a more or less the similar kind of results. And coming to uh, clinical efficacy of these two different drugs, as you can see, overall, they're more or less the same. So this is 48-month study, and this one's 24-month study. So volume changes do take place. IPS improves. And the volume changes with both of them, on average, we can put this to the patient that overall prostate volume can reduce or it can shrink from 20 to 25%. And then uh, improvement in IPSS and then maximum flow rate is noticed as well over the period of time. And then this is what I've already done mentioned in the previous slide, reduction of relative risk. The side effects of these medications sometimes are intolerable for the patient, especially for the younger patient. We tend not to give in to them because it results in reduced libido, erectile dysfunction because of the type of mechanism of action and ejaculatory disorders. And if patients if patient report gynecomastic or breast tenderness, then it has to be stopped and it's all reversible. Then coming to some um, uh, evidence uh, around combination therapy, which is a combination of uh, alpha blocker and uh, five inductase inhibitors. So that's um, the first trial that comes uh, to our mind uh, uh, to prove the effectiveness of this kind of thing is AMTOP uh, um, uh, trial study. That's medical therapy for prostate symptoms. So this study recruited more than three thousand uh, patients with the mean and with the mean follow up for around four and a half years, and mean AUA or IPSS score in these patients was 17, and prostate volume was 37. So the final results out of this study show that if the combination is used, then the reduction in overall uh, clinical BPH progression is 66%. If we use the drugs individually, either alpha blocker or 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, the range is between uh, 34 to 39%. So overall combination in patients who have got low urinary tract symptoms and large prostate raised IPSS more than 1.4, the combination can be helpful. And then reduction in risk of acute urinary tension and surgery is there. With the combination, you can see is 80% 80 80 uh, reduction in uh, acute urinary tension and around 70% reduction in surgery. So that is an important study that shows establishing the evidence of combination. A few graphs, as you can see, combination therapy actually improves the overall risks here. And again, acute urinary retention risk is reduced over here as well. And then uh, combination reduces the risk of BPH, need for BPH surgery as well. So another conclude the doctor study uh, establishing. I've got a few more slides. Is that right? Yeah, okay. So, uh, COMBAT study again is just like establishes the uh, tamsulosin uh, effectiveness here. I'll move on from this one. And then, a uh, couple of uh, important slides on ALFO study. But ALFO study, I'll take you to this uh, diagram here. So, if someone coming with acute retention and starting an ALFO blocker, then trial of the mode of catheter is given, it 
which means that it results, it improves the effectiveness and it improves the success of a trial. If again, these this, uh, alpha blockers continue to this patient, actually it reduces the need for future surgery. And then um, uh, PD5 inhibitors, which are again um, uh, mechanical action, we know that they cause uh, dilatation of the vessels and improve the flow. Here is the most important slide. We'll say the PD5 inhibitors like the Danaquil and Danaquil improve the IPSS and they improve the IAEF score. So actually, patients are coming with both symptoms, ED and uh, uh, LUTs. They can definitely benefit from these medications. Regular use, uh, daily low dose use of these medications have proven their effectiveness. So finally, I would say that um, it's important to take the complete history, know the parameters that are there in the natural history or progression uh, trials, and then we can treat these patients successfully before they are require any kind of surgical treatment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kamran, and I apologize for rushing you. That's uh, all right. I, I know, I mean, it's a very thorough and very complete lecture and it's very helpful. I just have a question. You did not include the um, anticholinergics in your treatment uh, armamentarium for BPH related symptoms. So what is your advice generally? When should you give or not give? And just a quick review on that. I mean, I, I did not include anticholinergics is because I was just talking about the prostate. Yeah. So anticholinergics, um, obviously uh, they have got action on the bladder and most of these people become, develop bladder dysfunction. So if the trials of um, uh, uh, tamsulosin and uh, dutasteride, they're not working, the anticholinergics can be added. There are certain uh, combination of these drugs that are there. Specifically anticholinergics, I would like to add them if someone has got a urodynamics evaluation and they have got equivocal results. So, I mean, that's another way of adding them, but they have got important, uh, I mean, role uh, in managing the bladder dysfunction or overactivity of bladder, which develops as a result of obstruction. Okay. What about the role of uh, anti-diuretic uh, uh, hormone in, in patients with nocturia and BPH symptoms? I mean, they're bothered with nocturia. I know the problem with hyponatremia, etc. but do you believe they have a role in select patients? I mean, uh, certainly, I mean, that's why, I mean, uh, I put in this slide earlier that um, uh, showing different kind of uh, modalities that can cause uh, low urinary tract symptoms. I mean, most of these patients, when come, they come in with the prostate related problems, they have, we treat them around this kind of provisional diagnosis because most of us, we do not do any kind of objective ex investigation that is actually the urodynamics unless we give them a trial. So I think that's a step-by-step -step way. And if there is after the bladder diary or frequency volume chart, if there's something that's showing this and the prostate is not enlarged and not causing problem, I would straight away move on to treat nocturnal polyuria. Okay, that sounds very interesting. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kamran. And uh, we'd like to uh, finish up with uh, Dr. Ahmed Reynizi. Dr. Ahmed Reynizi is a consultant urologist. Uh, robotic surgeon from Mubarak Al-Kabir and also Sabah Al-Ahmed Center. Hayakallah Muhammad. So your talk will be about minimal invasive surgery for BPH. So give us something minimal invasive. <laughs> we can't hear you. Did you, smack me, did you hear us, Ahmed? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, I think I was muted, but uh, I'm back. Let me just see if I can share the screen. Uh, to come around, we should invite you for Futur here in Kuwait. So, anytime, yeah, <laughs> let the COVID settle down. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kamran, for this uh, informative uh, talk. Um, I, I think you have to uh, unshare before uh, Dr. Ahmed can actually share his uh, okay. his slides. Okay, uh, so I will. So you can see up, uh, stop sharing, like up in the screen on your side. Uh, I've done it. Uh, pause sharing and then stop share. Yeah, I've done yeah, it. Stop share. Yeah. So now Dr. Ahmed al will uh, be able to share his slide. Actually. Okay.
عندك ربع ساعه ابو محمد ها ان شاء الله ولا 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 How can I share it? Just uh, click what? Share screen? So share screen, then it will show whatever you, uh, screens are open. Yeah, great. So now if you put it on the slideshow mode from your side. Okay. So just if, if you're doing any, any presentation, Joe, go to the slide. Can you see it now? Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. And you can hear me well, huh? Great. Go ahead. Great. Um, good evening. Nice to meet you all. Uh, welcome, Dr. Kamran. We're uh, very uh, happy to uh, be connected with you. We've always uh, been a fan of your work as well. Thank so you. I will be talking about minimal invasive procedures for BPH. And let's see the first slide. Okay. So I will be... The map of the talk, I will be talking about background on BPH. I will not dwell on uh, details about it. I think both of you did a great job in elaborating over this. I will be just touching base on international guidelines, outcome, and cost, uh, cost and decision making. I'll be mainly focusing on resume. We've started resume as a minimal invasive therapy in Kuwait in December, and then we were hit shortly in two months afterward by this uh, COVID-19. So everybody has been on hold since then. How big is the prostate? As we all know, as we age, the prostate tends to get bigger and bigger as we age. And the normal size is the size of a, a walnut. And then some patients may actually have a progression of their prostate size and they can become as a ping pong, which is roughly a 30 to 35 uh, gram. Uh, which is the size of that prostate. And then some group of patients will develop to a huge and bigger prostate like the size of a tangerine. So regarding BPH, why do we need to know about it and how important it is? It is one of the most common diseases in aging group. Older age is a risk factor for clinical BPH, as you all know, and the prostate volume increases with, with age. And definitely, uh, now we are more aware of obesity as a risk for BPH surgery and urinary symptoms progression as well as initiation for BPH medical therapy. In addition, diabetes have been associated with increased prostate size, lower urinary tract symptoms and the need for BPH surgery down the line. A few more, more, a few more points about BPH. There is definitely overwhelming evidence to support coexistence of erectile dysfunction with LUTs and 50% of men below 60 years undergoing surgery for BPH had a heritable form of disease. And in addition, decreased physical activity and exercise have been linked to increased risk of LUTs and BPH surgery. As we all know from our practice as well, medications can produce unsatisfactory symptom relief and associated with troublesome side effects and around roughly one third of these patients with moderate to severe symptomatic BPH are on continuous drug therapy for the rest of their life. What sort of symptoms? We are guided by clinical, uh, our clinical history in terms of the obstructive symptoms. Also our management and investigation is guided by the obstructive, irritative and the symptoms of complication of BPH. We also rely on uh, IPSS directly and indirectly, indirectly by taking the history and directly by actually going through the form itself to, uh, um, to, quantify and, uh, to quantify the patient's symptoms as well as to uh, ascertain their uh, quality of life in terms of the Bother score. Our management tends to go through observation versus dietary supplements. Then we might go to medications if the symptoms are moderate to severe. Later on, we would consider definitive surgery such as TRP, which is the gold standard, uh, homium laser or green laser, and uh, recently emerging thulium. And now we have more tendencies that we have subgroup of patients who might benefit from alternative medical therapy to medications or as a bridge to surgery if needed. 
And some of these, like TUMT and TUNA, have faded away because of their uh, complications and also because of the uptake of these procedures. And more or less, we're left with two, um, um, uh, uh, two uh, minimal invasive uh, surgeries, such as Resume and Euro left. Side effects of medication. Uh, let me just take a second. Side effects of alpha blockers that we tend to use. Uh, we all know that it can cause abnormal ejaculation, decreased amount of semen, low blood pressure, dizziness, headache, and blurred vision. Moreover, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors such as finasteride or dutasteride, they can cause impotence, trouble having organ, um, organs, an orgasm, abnormal ejaculation, swellings of the hands and feet, uh, swelling and tenderness of the breast, dizziness and weakness. Moving to the standard surgical treatment, which is TURP. We all love this procedure and we all, tend to, we all more or less practice it. Uh, however, because of uh, uh, certain uh, limitations of TURP, such as retreatment rate around 1-2%, depending on the data that you tend to review, uh, as well as complications, retrograde ejaculations around 65 and maybe it can reach up to 85 percent, erectile dysfunction give and take around 10 percent, urethral stricture, urinary tract infections, bleeding and urinary incontinence, whether it is urgent incontinence or uh, uh, stress incontinence. So TURP also requires the use of general or spinal anesthesia and carries a hospital stay for around two to three days. Hence, we all move to searching for new other modalities such as um, to, to um, in, in a way to uh, as, a, as an alternative strategies for, for TURP. So resume is one of these uh, minimal invasive uh, procedures we have as I outlined earlier we've introduced this to Kuwait in December and resume uh, relies on the use of radio frequency energy which produces water vapor stream and the ultimate aim is to cause tissue necrosis at the transitional zone of the prostate. It has gained FDA approval in 2015 and it has the advantage that it can be used on median loop. And as you all know, median loop can be very challenging uh, to us as urologists because we have a group of subgroup of patients who, have, uh, refract, who are refractory to medical therapy because of this median loop. So in a way, it can be used as an alternative to medical treatment for those subgroup of patients. And this is how the gadget looks like uh, and how the water steam comes out of uh, the end of it. And this is just a, a, a quick uh, view how uh, the gadget itself, the resume arm, how does it look like inside um, the urethra on the way uh, to the bladder and you can see the prosthetic lobes in between. So how does it work? Just to give a flavor of our audience, uh, it utilizes water vapor, which is delivered through um, a retractable vapor needle via emitter holes in the transurethral device. Around nine seconds births are used into the, uh, in the transition zone of the prostate. And we utilize this convection as opposed to conduction. And uh, convection is literally when you try to boil water and you get the steam, but instead of using the um, the fire below, uh, we are actually relying on the steam itself for to to um, to uh, uh, transmit heat. And this uh, thermal therapy or this form of water vapor diffuses evenly through the target tissue, and the depth of the needle is around 10 millimeter. And the contact body temperature tissue allows the water vapor to condense within the tissues of the prostate, eventually triggering cell necrosis. In addition, overlapping injection can be utilized and can be applied to the fully targeted area of the hypertrophied uh, part of the prostate. We utilize a saline flush through this gadget that I showed you earlier to cool the urethra. And the majority of patients can be done either with oral sedation only, or one of these patients, one, one uh, out of five of patients may require prosthetic blocks and 10 to 20% require intravenous sedation. 
So in a way, this is a very nice alternative modality because you can use it as a day case. The, according to the uh, uh, published uh, literature, uh, greatest improvements tends to be seen one month. From my just personal experience, when we did the first 23 cases, I would say probably I would allow up to even six weeks before you would actually see the first sign of improvements. Uh, the advantage of uh, resume therapy is it, it has no uh, causes of ejaculatory or uh, sexual dysfunction, or, although there have been reports that it can actually reduce loss of uh, seminal volume in around 3%. I'll come to that later. And possibly there are some subjective improvement in ejaculatory and sexual function by uh, around 30%. So some patients are actually reporting, despite having an IEF5 uh, um, uh, or the SHIM score, uh, which did not show much change of a baseline, but 30% of these patients, they actually, they report improvement at, at a subjective level. And there's certainly significant symptomatic relief of LUTs when you compare it to baseline medication. There are emerging data, which now tends to actually uh, 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 break the boundaries. Our level uh, um, initially uh, upon the recommendation of the FDA and the NICE guidelines and the Canadian guidelines is to use resume for uh, patients with a prostate more than 30 and less than 80 grams. But now there are emerging data from abstracts that have been submitted to uh, international conferences lately that it can be utilized in urinary retention and in patients in uh, home care. Uh, and uh, it has been utilized in patients with a prostate around 90 gram and maybe, maybe up to 100, but nothing more than that. The lovely part about this procedure, while Dr. Hussain is doing a TURP, a lovely TURP over six minutes, 60 minutes, I can do maybe six or 10 resume in that list. And get more money, huh? <laughs> uh, I'm not too sure about that, but uh, that's, that's the beauty of resume. So there is a lot of... And you, if they fail, you do TURP with Dr. Hussain again. Yeah. Um, and um, so the lovely part of this, you actually feel a sense of achievement. You're doing more cases. And as I said, you can do a high number of procedures. So uh, Resume is, has the advantage of targeting also a median loop, which you, you tend uh, not to be able to actually get a satisfactory outcome with, with patients who are treating medically with it. And there is a benefit of cost saving benefit, uh, cost saving in, team, in terms of decreased hospital stay. Uh, one of the downsides of this resume, and you have to counsel these patients really, really well. Otherwise, they might just turn, their off, uh, you know, turn them back and maybe go to Dr. Hussain and have their TRP done. Uh, so you have to convince them that they need this fully catheter for four to five days. I've managed with my counseling to actually have it uh, make them have it for seven days uh, and I will show I will tell you why I actually did this and you may consider prior a flexible cystoscopy as Dr. Kamran uh, nicely showed that depending on your um, uh, your clinical history if the patient has hematuria previous surgery or if you're not too sure about the diagnosis you will definitely combine flexible cystoscopy uh, beforehand this is how the images look like uh, this is a, a median loop that you can see because of an enlarged prostate and look at six months later how the urethra is uh, well and patent around the bladder neck and this prostate size was, was around 50, uh, 50 gram. The One of the limitations that we have is the evidence-based. Uh, we only have until this date is a, a one randomized trial and this has been uh, reviewed and edited uh, lately in around April, around April in 2019. And uh, they, we, we uh, managed to actually uh, scrutinize the outcome of uh, resume uh, over, over four years period. Uh, our colleagues in Canada have actually included it in their guidelines. They have endorsed it with very standardized and also um, uh, meticulous, meticulous uh, criteria. Uh, and, and as I said, we have to compare apples with apples. Uh, resume should not be compared with TRP. TRP remains the gold standard. And this is just a, another option that patients can utilize. Mohammed, uh, 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 nice guidelines from the UK, 
and this has been also endorsed and with recommendation about how to use it. More or less, the American Neurological Association, the Canadian Neurological Association, the NICE guidelines, they fit together in terms of the recommendations. So uh, I'll be moving about, I'll now more or less comparing, just move, move on, just to compare, to show you just some outcomes. Uh, and this is our level of evidence. Uh, Euroleft, for example, has five years experience with two RCTs, resume one RCT, three now four years experience. HOLIP and PVP, we have up to 20 years with randomized trials, more than 30. So let's just talk about out outcomes and, and let's compare them head to head. I haven't included TURP because, as I said, I still consider it, you know, a different entity and different modality and should not be compared. But let's just have a flavor how, how uh, things look like when you compare Euroleft and Resume and Holland. So, um, beg your pardon. So here, for example, the IPSS has improved significantly after three months, uh, more or less head to head with Euroleft is similar after 12 months you have more uh, uh, sustainable uh, improvement of IPSS. Uh, definitely HOLEP and PVP tends to be higher and we know this for a fact because you are actually inoculating the prostate or vaporizing the prostate. Uh, so you won't have any residual tissues. And the long-term outcome after 36 months, improvement in IPSS by 11 points. In terms of the uh, uh, butter score, uh, again, resume and Euroleft more or less similar. And uh, at 12 months, they both sustained it really well. Holep tends to be much better, of course, and the long term has been uh, more or less uh, better uh, after 12 months in terms of the improvement of the better score. What about uh, the Euroflow, the QMAX? We tend to be dragged on a lot about how the QMAX look like. It feels us much better, but I have discovered actually from the set of patients that have that I've operated on, that you may have marginal improvement of QMAX, but tremendous, tremendous change in IPSS and Butter score. But let's more or less look at the data here. The baseline of the resume was around, uh, uh, and Euroleft around 10, so slightly more advantageous for resume at three months, 12 months, and uh, even long term, the, the QMAX tends to be much better uh, in terms of the figures around 3.5, whereas in HOLEP or PVP, it's around uh, plus 14. In terms of sexual outcomes, Eurolift did not have any compromise for erectile function uh, and no change in IEF5 score. Resume more or less the same, no change in erectile, and doesn't cause a deed. And uh, I would say around two to 3% of patients may have reduced volume uh, ejaculatory volume, no change in IAF score, and I have actually found out that some, some of my patients, they have subjective improvement uh, in terms of sexual function, um, uh, and hopefully when we, do, when we do more data, we, know, we will know if this is actually being validated well or not. Uh, in terms of HOLIP, uh, again, the baseline may not actually change. The orgasm actually may change the overall satisfaction. Uh, uh, more or less may stay the same, but the huge, huge problem with HOLEP or PVP is retrograde ejaculation, which can be up to 85%. So let's move to complications. What sort of complications? Um, Most minutes, of the uh, complications Ahmed. that I have been seeing with resume, Dr. Dr. Ahmed. actually, especially the minor. Yes. Okay. Almost, almost finishing, almost finishing. So resume tends to have, you know, around 20%, I would say, in the first couple of weeks to three weeks. Most of these side effects tend to uh, resolve. Uh, according to the RCT, acute renal tension was developed around 4%. And in, in our data series, the first 23 cases, we did not have actually uh, a real urinary tension, uh, but we're, we're waiting to have, uh, you know, more, more, uh, more patients to, to, uh, to quantify and analyze our data. In terms of acute urinary retention, with HOLEP, it's around 5%. So retreatment, this is very important when we counsel patients as well. With Euroleft, there is a huge uh, tendency for symptoms to uh, reoccur and also the need for further procedure uh, to remove the metals or consider other modalities such as HOLEP or TURP around 13.5. Uh, and resume so far up to the four years data, 
the number remained around four to five percent. Halep tends to have a tendency around half percent, and this is mainly because of the regrowth of the adenoma. So what about Kuwait? I thought I'd probably just give you a provisional data. I haven't uh, analyzed everything yet. And uh, we started this in December. We've performed around 23 cases. I left the catheter seven days because we were worried that if we remove it prematurely, patients will develop retention. So uh, I left it two more days just to keep me uh, feel right about it. Majority reported minor uh, complications, Clavian Dandu of one to two. Uh, most common complications that we encountered, dysuria plus minus urgency, frequency, maturia, around I would say 20 to 30 percent, and most of them resolved completely, completely within two weeks. I had one patient because I kept him on antibiotic longer, and uh, he developed candiduria and with severe UTI, uh, and he could not actually, you know, we did a PVR on him. He was not in retention. He was voiding well. But because of the severe dysuria and candiduria, and in order to optimize his drainage, we, we reinserted a Foley catheter for five days and then we removed it after he finished, after he completed his course of uh, antifungal treatment and he got really well and he was very happy. In terms of uh, improvement of QMAX and IPSS, uh, 22 of our patients had really significant improvement of QMAX and IPSS. Uh, I'm pending to uh, really go over their uh, sheet and analyze these data later on. We had one patient who did not experience any improvement in QMAX, but he was very grateful for the procedure. He said, I'm sleeping really well. I used to, you know, wake up five times at night, and now I wake up just two to three times. And his brother's score changed from six out of six to two out of six. So this actually make us revise whether we need to rely, you know, go and dissect all the domains of IPSS when we manage our patients as opposed to have a holistic approach to the IPSS itself. I had no incontinence of these patients, no retrograde ejaculation, and no erectile dysfunction. 30% 30, 30 of these patients would just tell me they feel much better in terms of uh, their erectile function, despite no change in IF score that much. And this is just one, one simple satisfactory uh, uh, photo. This is one, one of the patients who had, this is his pre-op before, before resume, and look at six weeks later. This is a huge, you know, change in care, and he was very happy, and his QMAX is around, I would say, 14.2. Uh, and his residual volume was here 70, but this patient had previously, his residual volume was, was uh, way higher than this in a couple of regions. So in terms of advantages, you relief tend to have the catheter for one day, more or less, or less, and resume tends to have it four to five days. Holop, you can remove it within 24 hours, uh, or earlier. The learning curve for Urolef is around five cases. For Resume, I would say five to 10, and I would agree with this. And Holep is around 20 and 50, and maybe more to some urologists. And in terms of anesthesia, you can do both Urolef and Resume under local or general. And Holep, um, uh, you can do it with general or, or even, uh, or you can do it only with general anesthesia. So let's call, finally just to give you a flavor about cost, uh, cost and decision making. So currently, no, no European data that I've seen. Uh, in the state, there is one nice uh, study with simulation modeling about the cost and the retreatment and treatment of complications after having QRP or resume or even Euroleft. And this is a very nice paper published in the clinical economics. And the idea is to compare comb combination therapy versus resume versus Euroleft versus PVP and versus TRP. And here, this is the way they have put a simulated model and based on the insurance cost of each modality of treatment, as well as complications and retreatment. And you can see from the study here, they actually uh, quantified whether the patient had early uh, um, adverse events, how much the cost was, was for this, and in terms of follow-up, did the patient develop retention, what sort of uh, modalities uh, of uh, retreatment that he had, uh, and UTIs or, or incontinence or even ED. Because if patients develop ED, it means that this is extra cost on the, on the patient. And, uh, and that should be taken into consideration, into consideration in terms of cost effectiveness. And this is more or less, this is a nice conclusion uh, uh, picture for, for you guys to see. If you compare, for example, uh, green light with resume, you will see the blue line more effective and more costly 
uh, for the green light because on the long run you would not actually need retreatment and when you compare resume with combination therapy you will see that for resume it is more effective and more costly because these patients will save money on treatment on a progression of the disease and getting urinary retention and when it comes to urolift and resume it urolift had less effective and more costly so it costs around probably i would say seven to eight times and in some in some countries also 10 times the cost of resume and because of the retreatment rate and resume actually went here in terms of green light and TURP, TURP and green light more or less the same, but you will see that green light tends to be more costly. You will see more blue here as opposed to the TURP part. And when it comes to resume and combination therapy, look at this curve. So this is less effective, more costly, more effective, less co and more costly. So this is more advantageous for resume. Lastly, for TURP and resume, I don't know if I will be able to convince my colleague, Dr. Hussain and Dr. Ahmed al kandiri uh, I think resume will be more co effective and more costly on the long run because of the low side effects, low adverse events, low cost even for retreatment, uh, as opposed to TURP with all its potential complications uh, over two years. Uh, as I outlined earlier, the cost of Eurolift is around 3,500 more than the resume itself, so it's more expensive. And resume procedure tends to dominate from my point of view. Lastly, uh, I will show you just this slide. Uh, again, let's compare apple with apple, uh, so apples with apples, not apples with oranges. So uh, when we look at the data, we should uh, you know, uh, not compare resume with TRP. Let's co compare resume with Eurolift or other modalities. So we have medical therapy, MIST, minimal, minimal invasive therapies, and definitive uh, therapy, therapy such as HOLIP and TRP. And this is another slide that larger prostate, we, we still rely on simple prostatectomy, whether it is uh, robotically or open. Uh, and uh, we, we utilize HOLIP and uh, TOLIP with average prostate. Many uh, modalities are uh, applicable with smaller prostate, uh, less. And finally, this is just my uh, conclusion. We must weigh the efficacy and invasiveness, cost and the skill. Uh, Eurolift and you resume similar efficacy, low complication rate. Resume is more cost effective, less retreatment rate than Eurolift when it comes to minimal invasive. And it preserves, uh, both preserve sexual function uh, and both can be utilized for prostate less than 80. PVP and HOLIP, uh, higher efficacy and lower treatment rate. And lastly, they can be used for any prostate size. Thank you very much. I apologize for Dr. Ahmed Al-Kandiri. Uh, thank yes. you for giving me another five minutes extra. No, I, I wish I can give you all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for this excellent and thorough talk. I wish I can give everybody the time. It's just, I know our colleagues uh, uh, gave suggestions that we can stay longer, but I, I'm just trying to make it more attractive. If you take long, you lose concentration. So I'll just take a few questions from the audience and I'll go with you, with the, with the panel, about a few cases. Dr. Kamran, there was a question from the audience. Can you combine two alpha blockers? If the patient does not respond to one alpha blocker, can you combine two alpha blockers and can you give like extra maximum dose of label to improve obstructive symptoms with alpha blockers? Do you hear me, Dr. Kamran? Your voice? Okay. Did you hear the question? Yeah, I can. I can. I can. I, I heard the question. Sorry, I just unmuted that. So, uh, alpha blockers depends on which kind of alpha blocker is being considered. I'm not sure in Middle East, I mean in Kuwait, what alpha blocker you prefer. We, we commonly have this uh, tamsulosin, alpizosin, and also silosin or rapaflow like in, they have in the States. So these are the three common. Sure. Uh, so the oxazosin is all, all out of favor, terazosin, like they are, they're not available anymore. Okay. okay. So, I mean, uh, tamsulosin, um, I have seen some people, specifically general practitioners, because uh, the way how the UK system works, they go through the general practitioner and then come to the hospital. Sometimes they have given patients off-label or just like a dose that's an additional dose, but it doesn't work. It results in more side effects. Same with non-selective alpha blockers. They will definitely result in increased side effects and that can affect, uh, that can have cardiovascular effects or other. The answer to this question is 
It's not been used, not been tried. There's no evidence that I at least know. I mean, I, I've seen the literature recently as well. So the answer is no. Yeah. Okay, well, I have anecdotal cases. Patients tried and they said they improved. So I tell them, well, if you have no side effects, just you continue. But uh, you're right, there's no evidence to prove that. Mm -hmm. The second question from the audience to Dr. Ahmed Al-Nizi, Dr. Ahmed, is there a limit? You mentioned that size for re resume. And can you do a uh, resume on patients who are anticoagulated, like on warfarin, for example? Excellent uh, question. Yes, you can. You can use it, actually. This is one of the beautiful uh, uh, procedures that you can use in patients with anticoagulation. Uh, I tend to liaise with the hematologist. And uh, uh, also, if I can bridge them, I would. But I have actually attempted one case uh, where I actually omitted just uh, warfarin for a couple of days. Uh, uh, with the recommendation of our hematologist and we managed actually to do uh, a couple of cases and uh, they you know things uh, uh, went uh, uneventfully uh, and in terms of the limit of the size of the prostates I'm sticking by the guidelines because we are okay. still very early on in, in Kuwait mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm very I'm very strict in my in my in following the guidelines I've been pushed to ask, even ask to get patients with urinary retention to be done and some of them are very educational they went to Google and said look and in the States they are doing uh, yes. so the sound that leg to Rahmed is okay. still very early on we have to be very okay I can you hear me Yes, yes, see. Okay, so uh, are you, yes, go ahead. You finished? The did, you, uh, did you hear my answer? Yeah, it was interrupted at the end. So your, your upper limit of size is 80, as you mentioned. Is that right? Correct. We're, we're okay. going up to 80 uh, at the moment, more than 30 and up to 80. And, 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 and the, the middle lobe is not like uh, exclusion for uh, resume? No, median, median lobe is not an exclusion. They tend to do well, actually, these patients. Okay. Uh, no. because they tend to have, they, are, they, they tend to be very from Yeah. Yeah, in Eurolift, some surgeons, they were resecting their middle lobe and then putting Eurolift laterally. They said their middle lobe, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sight is not very reliable. Uh, I, I think I will go to the quick case discussion. Can we change the slide, uh, Dr. Hussain? Uh, Dr. Ahmed can uh, actually stop uh, sharing. Yeah, let's just do that. Muhammad. Yeah, the, uh, up on the screen, like you'll see uh, red uh, in the middle of the screen, it says stop sharing. Yeah. I think you stopped sharing already. I think so. I think so. Yeah. No? Um, Muhammad, you mm -hmm. can start sharing, Dr. Ahmed Kennedy. Then, and I'll the huh? Yeah. I have so, very few, few uh, four cases discussion for the panel. Uh, now, uh, just we, we have to bear in mind that uh, Dr. Kamran has uh, iftar. I'm not sure yeah, how, that's, no, no, خلاص. how much time he has, Dr. Kamran. That's that's okay. I mean, uh, we've got, uh, yeah. got about 15 minutes, so that's okay. No, no, we'll give you the question and then you can have iftar and make dua <laughs> for us. Uh, how do I, uh, how do Turkey, how do I share? Just so share? you just uh, move your mouth okay. to the bottom of the screen, there okay. will be a share screen, okay. Press it, then choose uh, your PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. So the, these are quick cases. I will we'll go for the first case. So this is a uh, uh, 58 year old. These are real cases. This one is a real case. 58 year old male who came to me with obstructive voiding symptoms since four years. His Q max was nine ml per second. Uh, his post void is not significant, like 40, 50, but the patient is very symptomatic. Like he's taking steps every. One hour he's going to the bathroom, straining, waiting. He's like, uh, anyway, his prostate on ultrasound, the abdominal ultrasound was 40 ml. There was no obvious middle lobe, which I think is interesting to follow and, and, and see. The patient used, he refuses medical therapy. He's otherwise healthy. He only has hypertension. He used Zetral, which is atrizosin. And then he stopped it because he had severe dizziness. He could like fall down. So now he comes to you, Dr. Kamran, before you go to Iftar. Doctor, I'm very irritated. I cannot PMT. I'm going frequently. And you told me the prostate is, can be managed medically. So can you change it to another medication or would you give me 
any of the advices like the other colleagues mentioned, like Eurolift resume QRP. So he has no trials except for one single time of severe dizziness with alkazosin, and he kind of he's, he freaked out of this medication. He said, "I can't live like this." I mean, this is um, he's he's relatively younger person. He's fifty eight years old. I mean, before uh, considering any kind of intervention, I mean, um, uh, I would just like would like to give him like uh, 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 all the details regarding the side effects related to the intervention. Okay. And I think this is a person who falls within the category of um, uh, something, a, a trial of second line treatment if the first line alpha blocker is not working. I and mean, this is someone who can benefit from um, uh, uh, pipe alpha reductase inhibitors as well. So which has not been tried in this person. So I would try to just talk to him about that. Okay. If he what are, he's very symptomatic and, and he, he was told like this will take time to be effective. So yeah, if he cannot... doesn't agree, then I think uh, um, uh, the other option is specifically this is a relatively new treatment, especially in a 58-year-old person, it resumed. No option about that. I mean, it's like a okay. large prostate and um, no middle lobe, lateral lobes are there. Resume still effective in the lateral lobe within six weeks, four to six weeks. The outcomes can be seen in this kind of patient. If it's available, okay. other options are he's going to go ahead with the intervention, just like other interventions have to be discussed then. Okay. Because of Corona, this is a real case and the hospitals are refusing to admit cases unless it's emergency. So you, you told him, I, I cannot do surgery for you. So then he asked me, can you give me another treatment which may help? Have you tried changing alpha blockers when they have side effects and you still can get away with the side effects? I mean, uh, alpha blocker, obviously, tamsulosin can be tried. I mean, we can certainly, certainly we have tried it, but most of the time with the alpha blockers, one alpha blocker, I mean, Zatrile is an alpha blocker, that's just obviously, it's alfusosin. I mean, it has got a wider spectrum than uh, tamsulosin. And uh, most of the time, in my experience, changing the alpha blockers it doesn't always work. So it just gives, I mean, although they are quick to work, I mean, within days, patients notice the symptoms. But most of the time, I mean, whenever I'm doing a general clinic, I mean, these patients actually do not get benefit out of it. So. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's in short my answer. The most people okay. get benefit by changing or switching it. Okay. Well, well actually, okay. because we could not operate, uh, uh, I, I gave him Omnic. I did cystoscopy for him because I was just make sure he doesn't have a stricture or anything else. And he does not have a large middle lobe as proven with ultrasound cystoscopically. He's like a small size prostate or you know, medium to small size. And uh, he's feeling mild improvement, and we'll see how it goes. Yes, Dr. Hussain. So, um, if you allow me, Dr. Al-Kendri, I will uh, comment on this. Uh, so, I think it's all about uh, expectations here. Uh, uh, if this patient had dizziness with Zetral, that does not mean he did not uh, uh, respond well in, in terms of avoiding symptoms to the, to the alpha blocker. Yes. So, I think he deserves another uh, alpha blocker. Um, if we look at the side effect and the uh, safety of, uh, of the medications that we're using for uh, PBH management, um, Zetral is actually more uh, safe, safer than Omnic or the Tamsulosin in terms of uh, hypotension. So if I want to change from Zetral, um, my personal option would not probably be Tamsulosin. I might use actually the newer uh, medication, which is Silocene or Silocene. Uh, because that is super selective, uh, the risk of having hypertension with the uh, silicine uh, might be uh, less than all others. The problem with silicine, as we all know, is the retrograde ejaculation. So once we, I explain to the patient well that he might uh, have a 25% risk of having a retrograde ejaculation, if he accepts that, then I think that would be my best option of treating this patient. What okay. if he does not respond? And you said you, you scoped this patient and he has a small prostate with no median lobe. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, I, as, as we call it obstructive, although this is not uh, objectively true, but uh, it looks like obstructive prostate. Uh, I was, was just willing to rule out any other cause for his uh, obstructive symptoms, like a stricture, etc. Yes, go ahead. Exactly. So, so what from, from this, if we look at the literature and if we look at the I've talked uh, about resume and neurolift, 
about this category of patients to the expert on those minimal invasive procedures. And actually they don't, they don't do well with those minimal invasive procedures because with resume they might have, uh, they might miss some of these spots and they might actually have some kind of fibrosis in the bladder neck if you treat aggressively the bladder neck. So mm. I think in this category of patients with a small, bladder very small prostate, uh, bladder neck incision is a very quick procedure. Uh, yes. The morbidity is very low. It's lower than the conventional TRP. And they do very, very well after that. Actually, most of the patients, they avoid like never they've done in their, uh, in their life. So Dr. Ahmed, might do you agree? Be, and now you I should mean, avoid you in a small you, size prostate or you'll be careful at least about bladder neck problems? I would agree with, uh, with uh, everything that was said, but uh, my only concern about this patient is first of all, whether uh, we need to have his IPSS done. We need to know his uh, SHIM score, IEF5 score. And I would like to know his PSA. That's, that's for sure before- PSA you know, is below, below one. Below uh, one. Um, was not done I would then, like to know his uh, post-void residual. It was around 40, 50. And another, another reading for Euroflometry, apart from just relying on one reading. That's and then, having, having, having said that, you know, uh, different modalities are, you know, once, once I'm sure that this patient is just fitting the criteria of BPH, I would like to know if he has completed his family. Even he, with he, has, he has completed his family. Correct. Even with QIP you still have a margin of retrograde ejaculation and reduction in seminal volume. Okay. So my, my other options would be between resume and Eurolift. Uh, depending on my, uh, the skills that I have, I haven't been trained on Eurolift and I'm not even a fan of it based on the, the literature that I've uh, uh, seen lately. So I would offer him between, you know, TURP or, or, um, or resume and even uh, laser, laser treatment, such as, you know, green laser or holic. Yeah, and I, I mean, with the, with the laser treatment, the issue is, um, uh, is it not that for the smaller prostate, because yes. depending on the intensity of the, there's a more risk of stricture. Yes, correct, Lernic. correct. Having, having said that, it's still, still you can offer, you know, you can offer laser uh, treatment, especially green good. laser like okay. vaporization for, for yes. prostate around 40. Uh, so my, my option with this patients, if I ruled out everything else, I would probably go for resume or, or TRP. Okay. Uh, I, because Dr. Kamran is in a rush to have iftar, this is the last case for you, Dr. Kamran. A 70 year old male with LUTs and BPH since five years, he was on medical treatment. He came to you in the emergency with a first time acute urine retention. The registrar put a catheter, they drained a liter and a half, they did an ultrasound. It's a large prostate, 150 ml prostate with large middle lobe. Uh, the treatment options, would you consider since this is the first time retention, you would drain him and, and put him on a trial of medical therapy or you will shift to surgery? What is your advice on that? I mean, um, this, is, um, this is a good question. And then, um, I mean, we don't see, uh, uh, we, we see these kind of patients very often and uh, the evidence that's there around the treatment, whether we consider treatment or intervention below one liter or above one liter, it's all changing. So, uh, I mean, it's a 70 year old man. I would like to know what is his uh, first expectation out of this and what is his uh, quality of life? What is his comorbidities like? If okay. he's really a fit man and without any problems, independent, then we would like to keep his or maintain his quality of life. I mean, the most important things here, we are looking at 1.5 liter stretch bladder with the actin and myosin fibers totally stretched out and there's no capacity for them to go back. So, I mean, if he's a fit person, then I would consider some kind of uh, intervention. A trial can be discussed depending on what the residual volume in future would be like, or if he's got ability to do self catheterization. That these are the options that could be discussed. But the options of intervention is more likely in this kind of person with 150 ml of prostate and 1.5 liter of okay. uh, bladder residual volume. So different options are there. This 150 cc prostate could be, I mean, uh, a laser procedure regarding the prostate, could be a green light or a hole. Hole is, is the yeah. more satisfying procedure or green light burns everything out. So what both have 
or similar kind of outcomes depending on the availability. I mean, we do both. Yeah, so just like, um, I think intervention is more likely that this person would be heading off to, but okay. also, and as I said, comorbidities is renal functions and a renal tract ultrasound scan would be required. And instead of ultrasound scan of the prostate, I would like to get this person to have an MRI of the prostate because that gives us more okay. actual reading in a prostate that's 150 cc. Okay, well, what about the timing of, of intervention? Would you wait a week, two weeks? And some people, like if you are above two liters, do you see a role for urodynamics? I have it in the next case, or you just go ahead and do the intervention and hope his bladder will recover? I mean, with the timing, uh, we don't do procedures straight away here, the way how the nature of the system is like, uh, healthcare system here. They usually wait about six to eight weeks or up to three months sometimes. Okay. But okay, so. if there is an option, I mean, timing, I would wait at least for four weeks in this kind of patient with regards to the urodynamics. The urodynamics, I mean, there's a varying school of thought. Some people say that above 80 is required, uh, above 70 is borderline. So urodynamics can be considered, but again, this is something that's another added intervention that would give us a picture of obstruction or it may give us a picture of overactivity of the bladder because this man is 70, he will certainly have some degree of overactivity of the bladder. So urodynamics not mandatory, not necessary, but if it's still, I mean, discussion takes place and then, okay, we are got, we are got waiting time to see, I mean, there's a waiting time for this patient. I would get this patient to have urodynamics, otherwise it's not necessary. Okay. Dr. Hussain Anizi, would you do to URP if you are an excellent surgeon and uh, let's say you don't want to do robotic, I know you are a robotic surgeon, but can you encourage, if you are a quick resectionist, and you can have a bipolar system and uh, you can limit yourself, let's say one hour, one and a half hour maximum. And you monitor the patient well. Would you do TURP for this patient? So for a patient with a 150 uh, grams of prostate, it's, uh, I think it's a huge for a TRP, even with a bipolar. The problem is, uh, uh, well, we don't have uh, the TR syndrome in TRP because we're using saline, but still, uh, fluid absorption might be a problem yes. uh, so yeah overflow so I, I think uh, we should not still with it with the verbal RTRB we should not extend the time of uh, the procedure maximum two hours we should be finished with with the TRP especially if this patient has a co comorbidities I think for a 150 no it's a it's a holib if someone is uh, well trained in doing holibs and they can finish uh, this procedure well or maybe another uh, 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 procedures that can inoculate the prostate, like now Open. more people are trained on doing, uh, uh, well, bipolar inoculation bipolar. of the prostate. My, yes. That might be another option. In my hands, I would do a robotic uh, simple prostatectomy for this patient. And they, they do very well after that. I think those are the options. TRP might not be the option. I know that some surgeons would say, uh, let's do one loop and finish and do another loop at that time. But that's two sessions instead of doing one session. I don't think that's uh, very fair for, for, the, uh, for the sake of the patient. Dr. Hussain, Dr. Ahmed Lanizi, uh, resume not for the size, huh? You agree? No, no. Okay. But having, having said that, having said that, there are now some preliminary data that, that you may actually and offer. And stage to resume? Limitations. Hmm. Okay. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't offer it at the moment, no. Okay, I have two more cases. We'll finish quickly. Uh, case number three, 60 year old male has frequency, urgency, urge incontinence. Uh, his urine flow, Q max is 10 ml, post void, he has 100 ml, prostate 60 gram. Dr. Kamran, this patient came to you, he's very symptomatic, he has frequency, urgency, but his still flow is, is weak. He's bothered by these urgency symptoms. So, what are the new treatment options? Would you give him tamsilosin and uh, solifenacin? Would you do urodynamics and cystoscopy and decide? Or would you operate? Or how do you proceed? And he's, uh, he's 60. He's got frequency and urgency. Degree of urge incontinence. I mean, how do we know that it's not an overflow incontinence? That's um, another question. I think I would like to look at the full IPSS score. And um, uh, urine Qmax is 10, which is uh, moderate for a, this age group. I mean, low below normal. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think um, the first question is that instead of tamsulosin and solifenacin, 
this guy is 60, in order to avoid the side effects, I may consider just like a trial of tamsulosin first, because the temp with the tamsulosin, you can tell straight away whether these people respond or not. Okay. Be depending on if the renal functions are normal, then uh, tamsulosin may well work in this person, in which because tamsulosin, it does not change the net, uh, progress, it does not limit the progression, but improve the symptoms. If the symptoms are improved, in the next few years, he may need some addition of medical treatment or may move or drift towards the surgical option. So tamsulosin may work. Okay. This. I, would, I would give a trial of tamsulosin. It okay. may work. Uh, let's consider he received tamsulosin and he did not improve. You added solofinacin. Then he was getting more residual urine and he's still symptomatic frequency, urgency, urgent continence. He has weak flow, but he's more bothered about this urgency and urgent continence. So... Would you do your dynamics at that stage? Uh, if, if, if you tried both of them, then uh, this guy is 60. I mean, there's a borderline indication for your dynamics. But uh, uh, I mean, in my practice, we do urodynamics a lot. I would definitely consider a urodynamics this person who's 60 years old, fit and well, no other medical problems before deciding on any kind of further treatment. Okay. So we did your dynamics, that's uh, considered it's done, and it shows that he's obstructed with an element of our active bladder. So now, what's your procedure of choice? If, uh, then I would like to know what is his uh, uh, prostate is like, whether if there's um, kind of lateral or median lobes. Or mainly lateral lobes, no middle lobe. I mean, mainly with the lateral lobes, I would, um, I mean, resume could be an option for this person as well. I mean, this is a new treatment, it's very effective, day case treatment, or, or a bipolar TRP. And, uh, but we, mm. We have got here at King's uh, mostly it's a green light or resume, but the bipolar TURP, depending on the load, whatever the expertise there. Uh, I have never tried Eurolift myself, but all options apply to this person. There's no question about it. Dr. Ahmed Danizi, will you do resume immediately after he fails medical treatment and he's obstructed? Do you think it's a good option for relieving obstruction? I think it's better to do urodynamic and cystoscopy on these patients. That's for yes. sure. You did the dynamics, he's obstructed. He has high pressure with low void, uh, with low Q max and overactive bladder element as well. And his cystoscopy shows obstructive looking lateral lobes. Let's consider that. Uh, then, then you may actually offer him, offer him with the, with the his prostate is 60, so you can yes. offer him. But he, this patient may actually uh, remain. He, um, yeah, he's bothered by irritative symptoms. He's obstructed. Would, me, you, me, would, me, would you worry that the, he get worse initially the first two few months uh, he has to be counseled that some of his irritative symptoms may persist and he mm. may actually need other alternative treatments for that this is very important okay. yeah so uh, you know addressing addressing patients concerns so we might be solving his obstructive part but it might take time for his you know irritative or the storage symptoms to come back Dr. Hussain I think this is a, sta a straightforward case for resident TURP is that right Yes, but it's not straightforward for the consultant because uh, those patients, uh, I tend to be very careful with those patients who are actually more bothered by irritative symptoms or storage symptoms more but, than but avoiding you, you, symptoms. You have a, a good urodynamics that he has high residual, 100, and yeah, he has yeah, a high yeah. pressure voiding. And uh, he has, as you said, you're absolutely right. He may need, as Dr. Ahmed said, he may need further treatment for his bladder if he does not settle down by time. Yes, this is right. why when, when counseling those patients, I will certainly tell them that there's a, a probably 20 to 30% chance of uh, their persisting. symptoms persisting after the TRP or whatever. I think he's, he's a candidate for any other alternative uh, uh, procedures. Um, will it be resume or uh, urolift or any other uh, uh, kind of procedure for PBH? But the problem is post-operative. Will this patient have his uh, irritative symptoms resolved or not? Um, okay. I, I tend to tell them that they might still uh, need uh, medications or further treatments for their bladder after the uh, like uh, solving their uh, obstructive uh, symptoms or obstructive uh, problems. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely right. The final case, Dr. Kamran, this is your free now. A 45-year-old male with BPH, this guy's young. He has obstructive voiding symptoms since he was uh, 18, weak flow, frequency. He was on medical treatment for the last 10 years. His Q max is low, 8 ml per second. He has a high post-void residual 100. 
He's married. He has children. He does not need any more children. He has five children. As you know, in Kuwait, uh, they like more children. His prostate is around 50 ml with large middle lobe. The patient still does not want to lose ejaculation. He failed medical therapy. He used all the alpha blockers. He did not want to use and, uh, five alpha lactase inhibitors. He's worried about sexual side effects. He's sexually active. So he said, doctor, I'm here for you. Can you do something as a procedure to relieve my symptoms and I will still preserve my ejaculation because he may get a second marriage and some of them, they want children. So what do you advise them? Um, I mean, um, he's 45 and he, um, it's been um, 10 years for these, this treatment. That's uh, not very, that's very unusual. And, but still, I mean, these are, are one of these kind of cases do come up. I think that first of all, I would like to see the urodynamics evaluation of the lower urine tract. So see what exactly it is like. And because uh, obviously there needs to be an objective evidence in order to prove the obstruction in a young person. That's like an absolute indication for urodynamics. No okay. question. If um, uh, depending on uh, uh, everything else, whether it's, it's okay in terms of his renal tract, his renal functions, I mean, the ejaculation preservation uh, surgery, endoscopic surgery, there are a number of options, even um, Dr. San Nazi just like mentioned yes. in his talk that there are TRPs uh, to that. We do green light ejaculation preserving as well. And to some extent, uh, uh, resume is, um, uh, I mean, be reported as a, uh, depending on where you uh, put in the steam as ejaculation preserving option. So there are various options for him. I mean, in view of the new evidence and new newer modality of resume, which is showing promising. So, I mean, this could be one of the options for him for management. But obviously he needs to know that all these uh, options are not foolproof. He will still have some degree of retrograde ejaculation. And if he's still looking for children or having more children, and his option, if he goes ahead and is not successful in terms of preserving ejaculation, could be IVF. Yes. Dr. Hussain, do you want can to I, add something? Yeah, can I comment on this uh, and uh, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, please. Uh, I think the only procedure that is uh, proven to preserve ejaculation 100% of cases is euro left so, so far. Even with uh, resume, there is a chance, uh, like 5% chance of uh, losing uh, anti-grade ejaculation. So if this patient is uh, very particular and he did ask about uh, a procedure that would preserve his uh, ejaculation for, uh, for sure or the most successful in preserving his ejaculation, I think Euroleft is the best option for this patient. Uh, however, the problem is the middle, uh, large middle lobe. I know that uh, some experts might actually uh, like okay. apply apply some urolef there, but this needs uh, an expert to do it who had uh, multiple procedures done. Uh, otherwise, uh, treating this patient might not be actually uh, successful. Uh, the, the other comment that uh, since you mentioned that this patient has been suffering for a long time and uh, uh, for probably uh, long uh, years of his life, um, I want to comment on something that, uh, unfortunately, most of those patients, they are diagnosed with chronic uh, prostatitis, although they might yes. have a problem with the blood or neck. Uh, and they, typically, those patients have visited so many doctors in the, in the, in the past. Uh, um, so please, please, if you have a patient with the symptoms of chronic prostatitis, pay attention to the fact that you ask about the urine flow and uroflowmetry, a simple test like a uroflowmetry might actually indicate that this patient has a genuine problem, not only chronic prostate symptoms where the pain is. Uh, so we, we tend to miss lots of those patients uh, without treating them properly. So that's my, my comment. Mr. Ahmed, you want to add something? I would, um, I would just um, um, assume uh, for this patient, he has middle lobe, 50 gram. I, I agree with both of you. These patients will need cystoscopy, will need urodynamic. We need to make sure he does not have chronic pelvic pain syndrome. That's for sure. These, these kind of patients will do worse with minimal invasive, whether it's uro left or even with, the, with resume. The, the implications would be even higher and patients would not be addressed. You know, the, the, the concerns would not have been addressed really, really well. Okay, uh, uh, this concludes our webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank Kuwait Urological Association for this uh, great opportunity and thanks to Dr. Hussain, Dr. Mustafa Mahmoud, Dr. Abid Nasr Sayyid, the chairman, 
And also our great thanks to our colleague from UK, uh, Mr. Kamran Ahmed, for your great time and, and, and talk. And we really enjoyed your talk. And we hope to see you soon in our next webinars or even after the corona is over. And also thanks to Dr. Hussain Lanizi and Dr. Ahmed Lanizi. And thank you very much. And I hope I was a good moderator and things went very well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much.